All right, hello everybody. I'm Tom and I come from a studio called Inkle where we, among other things, developed the software Ink. I say software, I think I mean writing tool. Um, it's less a piece of software and it's more a language for creating interactive stories. And this could be interactive stories from really simple choose your own adventures. So you're in a dark cave, do you venture in or do you turn back and retreat? Or it could be massively complicated things like if you wanted to build a story for an Assassin's Creed game with you know, tens of characters that all respond to how you play the game, where you've been, where you're going, all of these things are possible um, with Ink. It scales up to, we've seen games with more words than all of the Lord of the Rings books combined. So it can be used for little projects, uh, to medium-sized projects, to absolutely BMOF projects. We've got games on PlayStation 5 that have been using it and loads of games on Twi on Itch, sorry, where you can download little stories that people have written on their weekends or during game jams. It really is great for beginners um, as well as experts. So I'm going to just run through uh, some of the kit. I've got some PowerPoint slides. I'm gonna show you a little bit about what we've got included in the kit and how you can use it and a little primer on how Ink works. So uh, let's just share this screen. Okay, I hope you can all see that. Um, Chris, can I get a thumbs up? Yeah, there it is. Brilliant. Okay, well, welcome to Writing Interactive Stories with Ink. So, let's get started. Cool. So, what is Ink? Ink is an incredibly powerful tool for writing interactive stories. All of the games in this picture above have been uh, made with Ink in some fashion. Um, we didn't know about Sea of Thieves until very recently. This is one of the things about Ink is that it is 100% free and open source. So people can go off, take the, take the software, put it in their own games. They don't even need to tell us. We only found out because uh, somebody who uh, the company's co-founder, Joe, used to work with happens now to work at Rare. And he mentioned it offhand, um, like, of course, we would have known, which we didn't. Um, so it can be used to make text adventures that you can share online. It could be the script for a visual novel, or it could drive the plot of a 3D open world game if uh, combined with a game engine such as Unity. But today we're just going to learn the basics. So what's in your kit? The kit contains Inky, some demos, some interactive lessons, and a cheat sheet. So what's Inky? Inky is the software that we're going to use to write, test, and export our stories. Uh, you don't need to use Inky, an Ink story uh, is really just text and you could edit it in Notepad or Sublime Text Editor, whatever you want, but Inky is by far the best tool and so that's included in your kit. Um, next, we've got four playable demos, each uh, increasing in complexity. The first couple uh, I'm going to walk you through in a little bit. Uh, and the third and the fourth one are sort of fully playable games or scene from a game. Um, that you can take apart just to get an understanding of how they work and the sort of things that you can build in Ink. Um, they are probably more complex than anything that um, you'll be doing at least uh, with a short amount of time, but they're really good reference points. Uh, next, we've got 17 interactive lessons. If you just follow these lesson by lesson, try to get an understanding of what they're showing you, what particular feature of ink they're going to be using. You should be an expert by the time you hit 17. You'll know all of the cool features. You'll be able to stick bits together and build your own mega story from them. Some of these stories will test your knowledge. They'll prompt you to edit the script to um, glue bits together or to show you how things works. And uh, they're all nicely commented so you can see what they're showing you. And lastly, we've got a cheat sheet, which is a sort of big list of here's all of the cuff, uh, all of the things that you can do in Ink. Um, and it's just a nice reference point if you're editing and you've forgotten what the syntax is for a particular feature or whatever. So let's have a little look at a demo. Uh, I'm going to have to reshare my screen, aren't I? Hang on just a second. Okay, so let's have a look. Right, uh, can you see that? Brilliant. Okay, so this is Inky, this software here that we're running in. And you can see that on the left is this text and this is Ink. This is the script of your game. Um, and on the right is the game itself. And this is interactive. We can play this. We can play the story that we've written over here. Best of all, and this is a very simple story, right? You press a button, 
um, and then it ends the story. And there's a restart button up here. So uh, you're a Pokemon trainer, which Pokemon do you want? Let's take Squirtle. Bam, there you go. So we want the water Pokemon Squirtle. So you see the story has responded to the choice that we made. Well, we can change that if we want. We can say, we can add some more content. We can just type it in. First, you have to fight me. And bam, it'll just appear here um, because this part of the story is about where you are. And in fact, you could even go and change something that happened before. So we can change this from Squirtle to, I don't know, uh, Wartortle. And then you'll see it'll update here as well. So you can live edit here and then you can play your story here. So now let's have a, a slightly more advanced story. So this is the same story again, let's play it again. But this time we can choose Pikachu and we'll be told that we don't have Pikachu. So let's back to the start. Okay, this time let's take Squirtle. Uh, oh, and it self brings a choice. Are we sure we want this one? Yeah, let's take it. Ah, and now our rival walks in and he'll pick the other Pokeball and he'll always pick the one that counters your Pokemon. So it's exactly the same as the opening seed to the first Pokemon game. And you'll see on the left, this uh, script looks a lot more complicated. Um, but that's really just because there's a lot of choices that we didn't see there. So if we'd taken Charmander, we'd have gone here. If we'd taken Squirtle, we'd have gone here. Um, I won't explain how all of ink works straight away. I just wanted to sort of show you, this is what an ink script looks like. This is how you interact with it. Um, so let's have a look back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, Inky is the software that we just saw. Uh, here is a quick, um, master guide of all the um, features. Oh, hello. Sorry, I uh, just wanted to say your um, options tab from Windows is all is, is still showing. So you might want to. Oh, it is, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Um, wow, it doesn't want to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. <laughs> Try exiting this view, maybe. Ah, there we go. Ah, nicely, done. nicely done. Okay, so overview of Inky, we've got the help button up top that opens up some uh, documentation if you want to learn more. We've got the writing panel on the left, the playing panel on the right. We can rewind the story choice by choice here or entirely with this button. And that's all you need to know, except there's a couple of extra things. Uh, one of them is that there's a button here that lets you put in uh, some commonly used ink features like um, making a choice or checking if the player has done something. You don't need to remember how to do that. You can just click up here, find this button, and it'll just insert this text for you. Um, also, you can export your story as a web page. So all you do, file, export, tell it where to go, click index.html, and bam, that's a web page uh, that you can share with your friends. So you can put your story online if you want to. Okay, so um, now that's just a little bit about how what's in the package. I wanted to just sort of describe to you uh, the fundamentals of writing interactive stories using ink and a little bit about interactive stories in general. Um, so what is an interactive story, right? So the first thing, let's just have a look at what a linear story is. So a linear story is not an interactive story. It is a story that moves um, scene by scene and it doesn't matter what the player does, it just moves forward. So this is your classic TV show, film, whatever. The player can't really do anything that changes the story. So um, we're going to use the, the string of beads metaphor. So you'll see that each of these beads um, is connected by a piece of string and they're going to move from bead to bead. Interactive stories, the flow is far more flexible. The player can make choices that change the plot. The story should remember what the player has and hasn't done and it can adapt. If a character dies, the story might rewind to when they were uh, last alive, or it might just continue along a new path. So the most dynamic stories will respond to everything that the player can possibly do. And this little example um, string of beads that we've got here can just get absolutely massive. Um, so the most basic branching um, interactive story looks like this. It's just a single piece of content. Um, then we can add a choice. When you make this choice, go from one piece of content to another piece of content. Um, and I've just linked uh, one of the demos that you can look at, um, which is in the demos folder called basicbranching.inc, which might serve as a good example of how this works. 
now we can have a branching choice. A branching choice is the same as before, except for now we had two fundamentals, but I just wanted to get, um, get you thinking in terms of this kind of high level flow of um, pieces of content that are connected together um, by little pieces of string. Um, then we have gathers. We can regather the story back together so that regardless of which choice the player made before and what piece of content we showed them before, we now want them to come back to where they now are. So imagine that we're playing a game, we're talking to a shopkeeper. We can then ask the shopkeeper about the dragon in the cave, or we can ask him about the evil king. Uh, but regardless of what choice we take, when the conversation finishes, we're going to drop back out into the world. We're coming back to the same place. Now we can rebranch. Now we're in the same place. We can choose to either fight the dragon or fight the king. And then we can add more choices. And this is how these kind of stories get more complicated. And you can see how this would rapidly spiral out of control, especially if you have a big open world RPG where the player can do all of these different things and you have to write all of these pieces of content. So the challenge for interactive writers is to build a story that responds to everything that the player does, but doesn't get so big that they actually have to write all of it. Um, so this is why you need to be careful about which parts of the story you actually um, want the player to go towards. So whether you need to force them back onto the main path of the story, um, otherwise you're going to be making one infinite story which goes everywhere and will take your entire lifetime to create. So you have to manage your scope. You need to give the player the illusion of choice to some degree. Um, in practice, a lot of games are actually um, much simpler than you'd think. I don't know if any of you played the Walking Dead games. Um, they were actually very simple. This is their flowchart. And you can see that there are maybe 10 choices, if that, for the whole plot, um, or at least one of the episodes. And there's lots of smaller choices, but these are the big things that really change the story. So you don't actually need that many choices, so long as they're very significant, um, to make a big 3D game, like a big released product. Although obviously the more that you respond to what the player does, the better that game is going to come out. Bandersnatch takes a very similar approach. Uh, its graph looks a lot more complicated, but actually when you start boiling it down, it's mostly very simple. So if we zoom in on this particular section, you can see that we can um, we have two choices at the start, stop the conversation or tell him more. If you stop the conversation, it just skips the next bit. If you tell him more, it just shows you one extra bit of content. So it's not very complicated at all, um, but you can see how actually plotting things out as a flowchart can start looking really unwieldy, really fast. And if you wanted to make a really big game, you can sort of, uh, keeping all of this in your heads and on one piece of paper without having to move the boxes around can get really fiddly. And that's why ink uses uh, text rather than literally putting things in boxes and putting them together because it lets the story flow and join and branch in a far more dynamic way. So there's one other thing that we can do in interactive stories. Um, we need to listen to the player and we occasionally want to respond to what the player is doing in the game in a really dynamic way. So in Hades, whenever you talk to a character, they'll comment on something that you've done. And it might've been something you did last week or something that you literally just done, but there might be hundreds of different lines that they could say at any point. And how does, it, how does the game know how to do that? So how does this flowchart that we've built say, okay, well, the player's done this, 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 and this, and that means we'd like to give them this piece of content. You just can't do that in a flowchart. So that's where we need variables. So we need to respond to the state of the story. So have we met a particular character? Have we collected a certain item? Have we visited a certain location? And in Inc, um, we can use variables to track what parts of the story the player has visited, or we can just name pieces of content. Uh, this is all in the demo, so don't worry if this is overwhelming. Um, I just want to give you a quick understanding of, of the sort of things, or sort of ways that you can use ink. So one of the things that ink does is that it remembers all of the choices that you make in the story. If you go to a piece of content, it will remember that you've been there and it will remember how many times you've been there. And so ink is really good at tracking this kind of um, player state of just remembering that all of the things that the player has done. Uh, we can do dynamic text. 
So we can have a sentence that includes a character's name and pot potentially there might be a part of the, in the game where you learn the character's nickname. So we can swap out their name for their new nickname based on if we know about their nickname. And we can do this dynamically and we can nest this and we can do this loads of times throughout the story. We can change individual words, we can change individual sentences, whole paragraphs, whole pieces of content. We can change every single part of the story based on what the player doesn't or does or doesn't know in this really dynamic way. Um, in fact, I'll give you a really quick example of that. Uh, let's see. So we can have a look at sequences. So sequences are a feature of ink that lets you change uh, little pieces of content, either randomly or changing them in order one at a time. Um, that sounds a little bit abstract. So let's have a look at one it, um, in action. So let's have a look at a cycle. A cycle is written like this. I don't know if I can zoom in, I don't think I can. Um, never mind. A cycle is written like this, and it's really just some text between brackets. And each of the pieces of text um, are then shown in order each time you go to that piece of content. So in this piece of in this story, each time we revisit the same part of the story in this loop, the day is going to advance. So it was Monday, it's Tuesday, now it's Wednesday, now it's Thursday. And we can do this in lots of different ways. We can use a shuffle. A shuffle does the same thing, except for each of the days of the week would be randomized instead. So we're using a, a coin toss example here instead. And you can see that that content is going to be different every time. So if you wanted to have random content in your game or content that's different each time you play it, this is one of the ways that you can go about that in ink. And it's very easy to do. All you do is you write the content between two of these brackets uh, and you put this symbol at the front and then that's it. So we could go back to the last example where we're choosing the day of the week. And instead of doing that in order, we could change it so this is random instead. So let's just copy that syntax across. I just wanted to come in here. So the symbol for cycle is the ampersand or and, right? That's right. And the symbol for random, is that the tilde? It's a tilde, that's right. There you yeah. go. Thank you. I just I, I just wanted to capture that for the for the closed captions. And each time we click tomorrow, it's going to give us a completely new day at random instead. And there's lots of other types of these, and I'll leave that for you to discover as you look through the kit. So okay, so um a couple of frequently asked questions that we get a lot. Can we see ink as a flowchart? And the answer to that is no. And one of the reasons for that is what I just showed you, where you might have pieces of content that are randomized, which means that if you were to try to show the story as a flowchart, it would be a different flowchart each time you press give me the flowchart. It just wouldn't make sense. Um, so this is one of the examples of ink being a potentially very powerful piece of software. Um, to the point where a lot of the simple visualizations simply don't make sense. Um, another question, can I add images? No, ink is, think of ink as the script for your game, like you'd have a script for a movie. And you use the script as kind of the backbone and you don't necessarily show it to the player, um, but you might have stage direction in the script that's like um, the action hero jumps over a wall and that's just written in the script and somebody would go off and film that independently based on what's on the script. Um, and if you were building a game with ink as the kind of backbone for the whole experience, you might have a piece of text in the script that says, load this image, please. And then the game engine could take that and it could then show an image, but the actual image itself isn't a part of ink, if that makes sense. Um, if you have any experience doing any um, web coding or web development, you can use the export that Inky generates, and you could even look at making your own images, but that is totally outside the scope of this. Um, but it is something that you can go and do. Um, and can I use Ink in a game engine? Absolutely, you can. Um, you can use it in Unreal, you can use it in Unity, you can use it to build web games. Um, a lot of things are possible, um, but again, totally outside the scope of this. Okay, um, that is an explanation of the kit. Thank you for listening.
Cool. Thank you so much for that, Tom. Um, so we'll take questions from anybody who has questions. Just pop them in the Q and A section. Um, from from my end, I just wanted to make some clarifications regarding the uh, regarding the story jump. Uh, the first one is that uh, it is happening this weekend, so it runs between the nineteenth and twenty second of February, twenty twenty one. Uh, and it is happening on itch. I'm going to post a link uh, to that in the chat. And um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> in terms of in terms of you using uh, ink in other game engines, uh, feel free to if you want, and if you can find a way to a, a way to do that. But what we would be looking for in terms of the game jam itself and during the scope of the game jam, just feel free to use text only, uh, just as Tom has shown you. I think there are some really cool mechanics and interesting stories that can be told from a text only perspective uh, and. Yeah, I've seen uh, I've seen really interesting things done at a text only level. So we have a question from um, Jack here. I have used Twine before. Uh, is ink somewhat easier to use if you already know how to use Twine? Yeah, if you're familiar with Twine, um, ink ink is a lot more powerful than Twine. Um, there's a lot of things, and Twine is brilliant for building the kind of um, string of beads, like flowchart systems that I showed. Um, but ink allows you to go one step further. You can still do all of that stuff, but because it's sort of more conceptual than literal, you can break outside the boundaries of that, say by changing individual words or by having things that loop around in really weird ways or would be completely impossible to represent because of how big and complex they would otherwise be. Hmm. And a question, um, are you familiar, for you, Tom, are you familiar with the works of Chris Crawford, like interactive storytelling? I am, yeah, I've got his book over here. Mr. Crawford's book. Um, I actually told him about Ink ages ago, and um, he said he'd check it out, but I'm sure he never will. Um, he's off doing his own weird project. Mm. I'm just going to post the link uh, to Chris Crawford's website uh, in chat so that everybody has access to it. Uh, and then a question from Bogdan. Um, what do you mean uh, you can use ink inside the game engine? For example, how would you integrate it with Unity? Uh, good question. Uh, if you Google Unity ink integration, you'll find the plugin that we developed to Inkle and use on our own games um, that allows you to play an ink story inside of Unity. And it comes with a very simple demo that puts a button on screen for choices and shows the text. Um, like Chris says, I would probably not recommend you do it for this because you'll probably find you spend a lot of your time building the Unity side. Um, and one of the nice things about ink is that you can focus entirely on the script and then you can put that into Unity afterwards when you're done and you like it and you think, okay, now it's time to add some visual polish. Um, but it's absolutely something you can do. Thank you. Um, a question from Delano. Um, is it easier to make a multiple choice variable using ink uh, or twine? And generally, can you talk a bit more about the difference between ink and twine? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, ink's uh, variable logic is um, simple compared to a programming language like C Sharp, but far more complex or you know just more flexible than what you can do in Twine. Um, it supports all of the basic um, arithmetic stuff like multiplication and whatever. It supports um, lists. It supports um, a bunch of systems for dealing with randomness. Um, a bunch of systems for tracking state, um, being able to remember which parts of the story the player has seen and all of this kind of thing is just totally invaluable. And um, Twine has some of this, but it tends to be a lot simpler um, in my experience anyway. Mm. Thank you for that. Uh, Katrina asks for the story gem, are we limited to the four game engines presented or can we use something like RentPy? Uh, you need to make the game for the story jam in one of the four game engines, and those are Twine, Ink, Charisma AI, and Make Code Arcade. Uh, and 
ideally your starting point would be one of the kits, but uh, at the end of the day, you are limited by the game engines only. Uh, question from Ali. Can we use Ink in Unreal, just out of curiosity? Uh, yeah, we don't, um, we haven't created the plugin for it, um, but I know somebody out there has made a plugin. I don't know anything about it because I don't use Unreal. Um, if you look at the Ink Discord, um, there's a link to the Discord in the very last of the tutorial lessons in your kit. Um, if you go there and you ask about it, somebody, I think there's a channel for the, the Unreal plugin that you can find there. Hmm. Um, something that I also wanted to mention is that we will be expecting uh, expecting you on the Discord if you want to have access to the experts and uh, facilitators uh, for the for the story jam. Uh, and yeah, people there can also direct you to more resources should you uh, should you need them. But it's not mandatory to to join the Discord if you don't want to. A uh, question from Jason. What's the simplest way to create a basic level of visual presentation for a game if you're not quite ready to learn Unity at the same time? I'm thinking purely about things like static images, paper texture, or other things such as UI. Uh, good question. Uh, the easiest way is probably then to use a web export. Um, again, on the Discord, I'm aware that somebody's developed a really simple web export framework, and it's basically the same one that um, you can do by just going in Inky and hitting export to web, except it comes with some extra features, like it can, I believe, load images and play with sounds. Um, it's basic, but for something like a Renki game, for example, where it's really just, you know, show a character, show a background, I think it would be uh, fairly good, if not very adaptable, if you have um, any um, web coding skills. Um, I think also for the web export, Tom, we are going to need to discuss this, but the web, web export would be the best way to embed um, to embed a ink game or an ink game, what's the term, uh, into itch, uh, so that people can actually play the game that you've made in ink within, uh, within their browser on itch. Am I right? Yeah, totally right. Yeah, that would be ideal. Okay. Uh, I was wondering, Tom, um, I'm aware that you made a Game Jam game in Ink. Would you be okay with me sharing the link to that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's unfinished and slightly broken, but feel free. <laughs> so I just posted the link in chat. It was made during the Global Game Jam 2020. Uh, and I'll just quickly share uh, share the screen so you can see how the game looked like. Um, can you see this, Tom? Yeah, I can. Yeah. So this was uh, this was it. And I don't know if by downloading the source files, people can actually open the game in ink or not. Yeah, they will be able to. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So again, I I think um, is the was this a Unity integration then? This was Unity. Yeah. Uh, really, just for particle effects. It didn't really need to be. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, yeah, this is part of this is part of what you can do um, within with a well during a game jam if you're really good at ink and also if you've done things within community before, right? That's right. Yeah, um, it might also be worth having a look at the ink jam submissions. Um, ink jam is uh, something that we kind of host very very informally um, every year. I forget when I think it's in November, uh, and people have uh, I think it's a week or a month. Um, to write little ink games. It tends to be very part-time, so it's about the same quality level you'd expect of people doing 48 hours of sort of hardcore game jamming. Um, and again, these are sort of experienced ink users, um, but they might make interesting reference points for you or just cool examples of, you know, I want to see what other people have done in ink. Mm. I, sh I shared a link to the 2020 ink jam, uh, oh. and I'm also going to share a link to the story jam uh, so folks can join. Uh, so as, as I mentioned before, you don't need to be on the Discord, but you do need to be registered for the jump in order to take part. Uh, and we will expect a submission from you on the Monday. Uh, well, that that's really next Monday, isn't it? Time flies. Let's see if we have any other questions or thoughts from folks. One thing I, I wanted to ask you, Tom, uh, because I have a vague feeling that you've played games of uh, in narrative games of different lengths, is during 
during these webinars and the workshops themselves, we talked a lot about the length of games and what's possible within the scope of, uh, of a weekend game jam. But I feel like a lot of the time when we talk about short games, uh, it might also come with an association that is not going to be necessarily an impactful game. Uh, so I wanted to ask if you've seen interesting short games, uh, especially from a narrative perspective or an interactive narrative perspective. Yeah, loads. Um, I much prefer short games. I keep hearing this now, especially from people with um, little free time like me. Like I'd much rather have an hour playing a game that's brilliant and like meaningful and feels complete um, than like start playing another Assassin's Creed game where I'll kind of get five hours in and maybe put it down and, you know, never get to a nice ending. Um, like having a nice beginning, middle and end that I actually experience in one sitting is huge. And knowing that you've built something where you can expect the player to actually remember everything that's happened um, because they played it in one sitting is a real advantage um, that longer games don't have. Mm. No, that's a very good point. We have two questions uh, about the game jam itself uh, that I'll answer in a bit. But first, we have a question about interactive storytelling from Jason. Do you have any tips on how to keep track of your story as it grows? For example, where you've left choices without content or what parts of your story change the variables? Oh, good question. Um, this is baked into the ink language. So the way the ink works is it flows downwards. So you've got your content and it flows downwards like a book. And when there's a choice, it will kind of go inwards slightly. Uh, think of it as like indented text. And if you don't write anything after a choice, it will just keep moving downwards. So the idea is that if you've got content with a choice and then more content after it, if there's nothing in the choice content, it will just keep going. So the story might occasionally not make sense if you've got missing bits, but it will always keep going. And this is totally by design because it's very easy to end up with loose ends and it's better that the engine kind of just deals with it than throws an error or something like that. Um, but it is a real problem. Um, in our own games, we tend to, we have a little bit of software that plays the game a billion times and make random choices. And then it will tell us if it gets in like an infinite loop or, you know, does something weird. Um, so we try to keep track of that because yeah, in big storage, you can't play it all. Like, we made a game called Heaven's Vault and it's 20 hours long. We can't have played it more than maybe three or four times each. Um, and there are hundreds of ways to go through the game. It wouldn't be possible to play it and actually test it ourselves. So we have to use tools to do that kind of thing. Um, another tip um, for bigger stories is that you can separate it into several files. So um, instead of having one giant file that's got a billion words, you can split it into five files, you know, maybe one for each location or for each character, and it helps you to organize things. Hmm. Those are all really, really good points. Thank you for that. Uh, from my end, my first interaction with Ink itself was uh, Ink Writer, I think, or Inker Writer, uh, which was a, a web, heavily simplified web version of it. And I do remember that uh, even that was showing me uh, where I had loose ends or when, where I was about to go into an infinite, infinite loop. So yeah, that's right. And you'll still get those warnings in ink as well. Mm. So uh, Jack is asking about the theme for the game jam. So the theme will be announced on the Friday uh, morning and it's going to be posted on the itch.io uh, website. Well, on the itch.io game jam website. So we're going to post it at the top it's going to be the theme is and what the the theme itself um and then jack is asking about the best way to work on their final major project uh while at the same time uh squeezing in the game jam as they don't have a lot of free time so i want to stress this out game jams can be stressful and game jams have been known to encourage practices like crunch we don't want this. Well, crunch is when you work unreasonable, an unreasonable amount of hours and you don't rest just to put more work in your game. We don't want this and we don't expect you to work all the way throughout the weekend. Take regular breaks and make sure that you scope things properly. In a couple of days, I'm going to show you the game that I made in Make Code Arcade 
and I made that game during one day, maybe in eight hours or so, your submission for the story jam doesn't need to be extensively lengthy or it doesn't need and it doesn't need to be uh, it doesn't need to take a long amount of time to be able to play, play through in order to be valid as long as the game is playable as long as your story is playable that's all we're uh, and it actually has an end that's all we're looking for we're not looking for you to tell us your whole life story we're just looking for you to tell us a story um, somebody going to the supermarket and rescuing a cat uh, that's uh, th that's stuck in a tree, that's totally valid. Uh, it's just as valid as uh, deciding to write uh, the Odyssey, but with a, with a multiple choice uh, op option integrated in it. So we're just looking for nice, short, interesting, uh, interesting stories to to look at. We please, please, please rest and please, um, you know, ask for help. Don't stress yourself too much. Uh, you can make something really interesting and and something that uh, could get uh, you know could get awarded by putting in one hour or four hours uh, in making it, just as you would uh, by you know working all the way throughout the weekend, which we do not expect you to and we do not want you to. We advise against that. Um, I don't know, Tom, do you have any other thoughts on this? Yeah, um, here's a piece of advice that I wish I followed more, um, which is whenever you do a game jam, aim to have the game finished um, before the first night. So like in a third of the time, aim to have the game just done so you can spend the rest of the time polishing it, playing it, making it better. And you should try to be strict about this, but you'll fail because everything takes longer than you think it will and um, you'll probably find that you still run way over and maybe you even barely get it finished, even with thinking I'm going to do it in the first third. The nice thing about um, doing it with this sort of in mind is that even if things are taking too long, hopefully you've scoped it vaguely reasonably so that you can at least finish it rather than, you know, thinking that you're going to do something really big and realizing on the last day that it's just not even half done. Yeah, if anybody else in the chat has tips on uh, game jams, uh, please do share them. I think, Tom, a very good example of being able to still balance things correctly and do correct me if I'm wrong here, was the game that you've done for the Global Game Jam 2020, the one that I linked. Because I do remember that you mm -hmm. did spend a lot of time um, for yourself there, like not developing, but rather relaxing, socializing, uh, making friends, helping others, which is very important when when you're doing a game jam as well. Yeah, I mean, it's just fun to do that. It's nice to see what other people are doing and to talk to them about you, what you're doing as well, because you'll find you'll get like good ideas back from them. Um, and if you sort of get stuck about what your story needs, um, you're, it's almost impossible to have a conversation with yourself about how to fix it. It's always better to talk to somebody else and see if they have any ideas or literally just use them as a wall to talk against and see if when you say things aloud, if anything triggers in your own head. Yeah, and it's also important here to remember that there's a reason why the whole design of this program is around uh, interactive narrative. And there's a reason why we shared these four game engines with you as opposed to just saying, make a game in Unity or make a game in Unreal from like having developed games in both Unity and Unreal before, I know that I got stuck for days trying to figure out pixel perfect uh, collision in Unity for a platformer. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that I got stuck because I didn't understand how to expose a variable uh, in a blueprint and things like that. That's not what we want you to do. We want to enable you to tell stories uh, and make them interactive. And the engines that we've chosen are about as easy to use as we could find them, um, specifically to allow you to work on telling your story, not on fixing bugs. Um, yeah, like, you know, not having to, to worry about, I don't know, and the fact that you're trying to compare a string with an int and, and something is wrong, um, but rather thinking about, well, should I add another character to this? Or what if I branch narrative here? Like those are 
the interesting choices that we want you to make over the weekend. Um, Bogdan is asking, is it allowed to make the game uh, in ink, but use Unity integration to make it good? Yes, yes it is, but you should focus first on the ink story and uh, later on the Unity integration as, as Tom recommended. So if you can make the game in the first, in, in ink, in the first, uh, first third of the jam, uh, then, then yeah, by all means, go for uh, integrating it in Unity with the other two thirds of the jam. I don't know, Tom. Do you think that that's a that's a no key? Yeah, I think that's good advice. Um, just try to get it actually finished before thinking too much about polish. Mm. Okay, let's see if we have any other questions, and if not, we'll wrap it up here. I'm going to stop recording now.